black man in a negative way. Okay, and there was a lady right here. Yes, ma'am. You. Oh my gosh! Hi, Cleopatra. Okay, sorry. Go on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so that was just a simple one. What age range? Just the age. <laughs> Four to twenty-five. So you can see him later for those men. Right. Okay, I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay. Right. Um, Delia, Delia, sex and puberty. I think that's a that's that's a hot topic. Um, and Chris, you're a tailor, but I still think you got something to contribute to the conversation. Okay, because you're dressing them up. They may not come to serve the world, but what's the issue? How can we talk to men around issues on sex and puberty, purity amongst uh, boys and girls in schools? What's your take? Wow. Um, from a tailor's point of view. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Just make him a good seat. Exactly. <laughs> um, I think really some of the guys who come into our, into our, into, into the shop in, in general, they're not really youngsters. Yeah. It's the only thing. They're not like youngsters. They're, they're pretty much guys who are pretty much establishing their careers and so on and so forth. So it's really hard to get that perspective on to say, listen, you know, do I ever go into like schools and so on and so forth? Because I don't really get the young guys coming into us. But the only thing I can say is that you know when they do decide to get a little bit older and they do decide to like you know dress a particular way or and hopefully um, if they do come into us, we can actually say, listen, don't dress like you're in the street going to. I don't know, a job interview or something. Is there, you're, but is there, a role, is there a role for men to talk to boys? You know, the, you, you have men. Do you know, I'm, I'm happy to do things like that because I honestly, I've been to lots of like um, graduate kind of like events and workshops and so on. And I speak to them, I think, listen, your, your personal appearance is really quite a strong thing to actually uh, not let it slip away because that can, can be a case of getting a job or not a job. And you may think, well, what you're talking about? Well, if you have two graduates and they both got the same um, education and the same type of humour, whatever, if one person is dressing a little bit shabbily and the other guy's dressing okay, the person will employ the person who can go into their work tomorrow or right now, as opposed to someone who has to go out and perhaps try and not fit in or really fit in and get in the right garments. Okay. So that's the okay, I hear that. Um, um, okay. Um, Gary, Gary, you're busting to say something. It's to respond really to the question that Delia asked about um, the attitudes of, of young men and sexuality and so Thank forth. You. And I think there's often a, a concern um, reported in the media or displayed in the media about the attitudes of, of, of young black men in particular. And I think one thing that we need to try and understand about the attitudes of young black men to, to women or, or black men to women more generally is that we need to be careful that we don't look at these things in a vacuum because Western society is good to point its finger in the direction of more traditional societies and say how they are, don't treat their women particularly well mm -hmm. because their women may be veiled, for example, or covered up. And what we need to understand is that we live in a highly sexualized society. We live in a society in which, which sexism is frankly the norm. And in that particular in that particular society, women are viewed as sexualized objects. And you only need to look at the interface between women and public institutions. So for example, in my particular field of practice in criminal law, the convictions for rape and sexual offenses are at an all-time low. And as an indication, I think, of, the, of how sexualized society has become, you look at the pay rates, between the pay gap between men and women, and it's getting wider and wider. You look at the positions that women are able to achieve in society, and again, there is a certain amount of glass ceiling. So oftentimes I think there's a direction and a focus um, targeted against young black men and in particular to the sort of images that we see in perhaps hip-hop music. And whilst of course there is a debate to be had there, we can't ignore the wider society okay. and, and, the, and the sexualized attitudes that they take to women. I okay. mean for example, one earth how on earth do you advertise a car by having a naked woman standing there? Where's the cause you'll live? So the focus shouldn't just be narrowly upon young people and young black men in particular. It should be on the type of over-sexualized 
sexist society in which we which we exist. Right. Okay. That's that's very useful. Um, Kings, Kings, Kings. If I come to you, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I'm just having a little quick question here because the issue here is. Um, are we, are we, you know, I heard the conversation about rape. I, there's a lot of unreported rape that goes on. And in the, there's also the reality that um, if young men see their fathers having sex with 10 other women, then they have no values themselves. So can we speak about puberty? Um, can we talk to them about how to conduct themselves when their fathers really aren't conducting themselves? in like fashion. I don't know, what's the, how do we deal with our young men? Wow, I was, I was actually to, hopefully to address your question, but I don't think I could honestly add anything of value beyond what's just been said, just the way I feel about it. In respect to what you've just mentioned now, that's, um, it goes back to what I was going to touch on though, which is education, and it's in shambles. It, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's such a large topic and it's such an important thing you've raised, but fundamentally the education system in this country is in a dire straits. I'm, I mean, it's in a very, and I know I'm here, my parents are both educators, but I just, keeping it under 20 seconds, I just want to touch on the comment about media and quote unquote black men in media. The simple answer, in my opinion, is because you allow it. There's nothing else. It's, there, there's, it's that fundamental and that easy that when it's allowed to happen and concur, people just go on with it. There's, there's, it's very obvious. If you look at other cultures who either engage in things that you could not even believe and why it doesn't reach the media in the same proportion, they don't allow it. It's that simple, to me. Okay. Um, well, it's our fault. That's interesting. Professor Gus John. Um, I want to address what Delia was, was saying. Um, I chair an organization called the Communities Empowerment Network. Some of you would have heard of it, CEN. And we do quite a lot of work with young people excluded from school. We deal with about a, a thousand cases of school exclusions every year. Increasingly in the last few years, those have been about children of primary school age, black boys of six and seven and eight and nine, being excluded for what head teachers call sexually inappropriate behavior. And when we look at the actual incidents, in some cases, the head teachers, they don't handle it properly, but they have a right to be concerned. Now, it seems to me that if we fail to engage children in a discussion about the organic development the development of the bodies, the development of, of, of relationships with people of the, of, of, of the opposite sex. How we as adults deal with that, then we're leaving them totally exposed. Some of them copy behaviors that they see without understanding why those behaviors are inappropriate and then they go and play them out at school or anywhere else, mm -hmm. all right? Sure. So it goes back to what I was saying before. Where and how do we begin to embed those values so that we, we talk about respect for self and understanding of self in, in, in all our complexity, our bodily functions, our bodily development, the changes that come about at certain ages. So that children don't giggle about a young girl forming breasts. They don't giggle about stuff which then becomes salacious rather than normal, organic, and developmental. And we have to take responsibility for that. And if we don't, then we leave our children very, very exposed because they do not know what the boundaries are and they have no compass to guide them through their relationships with others. Right. Thank you very much. Melvin? I just want to echo that point because for us, the, one of the biggest um, demands for our service at the moment is about coming into work with boys from primary school, secondary school, and FE colleges being inappropriate around their sexuality yes. towards women. And, um, you know, with, when, you, when you talk about transition, you know, there's so much that we know about how well our boys do in primary school, which is often a safe environment for them. They have um, one teacher that goes through the whole um, uh, key stage two uh, program with them, knows them very well, it's an intimate uh, environment, and then they move into secondary school where they get hit and bombarded with peer pressure. And a lot of school transition programs focus 
wholly and solely on the environment that they're moving into, rather than the environment that's within them. Indeed. And so um, what, what we do within our programs is to focus very much on, do you know yourself? Do you understand okay. who you are as, you know, and talking about much of what um, uh, Time. Gus was talking about in terms of um, sexuality and, and awareness around um, the opposite sex and having those discussions and conversations as early as possible. Because once you reach, once you leave primary school and you enter into secondary school, the biggest factor for you as a young man is to fit in. Okay, I'm going to need you to come in. We've got only five minutes yeah. left. I'm sorry, I've got to wrap you up. You want to fit in, you need to fit in. And that is where so many of our young people get completely lost. Because they, before they move into secondary school, they do not have an, uh, that grounding about who they are. Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got to take the last part from them. Okay, so... Um, I've been given my five-minute sign, so I want to give you the right to ask the last lot. Okay. Um, if, right. One. Have you asked before? No, you haven't. Two. That's it. Two. Good. Oh, oh sorry, my dear. Three. One, two, three. Let's do it. Yes. Uh, my name is Nehanda, and I was just to ask the panel about males' perceptions of marriage and long-term relationships. Okay. Right. And the okay. Okay. That's a very good question. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Carl. Um, what men want? What I have come across a lot over the last decade, I would say, in London, is that men's egos tend to take over. The, the, the ladies will start to question the last of marriage, for example, and I think. The, the, the biggest problem I find is I sit amongst men and we talk, and I know what we talk about. And what I found happened a lot is that they were playing and making the problems. And I would question them and say, listen, you know, what did you do to make her do what she was doing? You have to look at yourself, don't look at the other person or the woman and play with her. Because at the end of the day, see, I, I come from a Sorry, I'm going to have to. That's, I'm sorry, I got to wrap it in, Carl. So, yeah, okay. What was that? Last bit? Okay. Right, thank you. And the last one here. My name is Victoria. What do men really think about commitment and being faithful in a relationship? Because it's not that thing. It's all right. Okay. okay, I got that. What do men think about relationships? I think it's all connected. These last are that. Commitment, relationships, cheating, men cheating. Is that what men think? Okay, um, you know what, guys? This is it. I'm going to do a one minute on each one of you. And I'm going to work my way through. And I'm going to start... I'm going to start from the very end, and I, I, I really, Charles, go forward. Successful relationships, stability, cheating. Um, you know what? Having any successful relationship is very hard work, so you just got to work hard at it. And sometimes people have to realize that they don't need to sometimes be together. And what happens is people grow in different places. So when we do see these uh, 